Thank you. Hello, Greater. Oh. Hello, Greater. How are you? I'm very well. And you guys? Fine. Good. <laughs> Is here. So I think we're almost there. Yep. So I was in time. I had appointment tonight. So. Shall you want to let people in? Can do that. I see more people trickling in. So Rama, we'll wait for a couple of more minutes for people to join. And then uh, Shelly will mute everybody and then we can get started. Okay. Okay, Charlie, you want to mute uh, and uh, turn off the video for others so that it's time to start. start. Please start. So, Amar, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, uh, that's a standard welcome these days, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, welcome all of you from around the world. Um, we have today a uh, talk by uh, Rama Govindarajan uh, from uh, um, International Center for Theoretical Sciences, uh, part of Tata uh, Institute for Fundamental Research at Bangalore. Uh, she got her PhD um, at Indian Institute of Science. Um, she worked for uh, uh, the uh, legendary uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, researcher Radham Narasimha. 
Um, and she did uh, a postdoc uh, at Caltech after that. And uh, uh, her research interests are in uh, uh, flow stability, particulate flows, uh, flows uh, with phase changes. And uh, especially she made a number of uh, important contributions uh, on uh, cloud physics and rain formation and so on. She's uh, very well decorated. She's the fellow of American Physical Society and uh, uh, all three uh, Indian academies. Uh, she has been on an uh, editorial board of uh, a number of important fluid mechanical journals, uh, Physics of Review Fluids, Physics of Letters, and uh, JF from Perspective. Um, um, she blamed the title on me because I had asked her uh, to make it really exciting. So uh, you may be wondering what it is. So you will like to know about what are waves that you might know, but non-waves and T's, she's going to be uh, discussing them uh, in the context of dispersed sedimenting ellipsoid. Rama, the floor is yours. Uh, please take it from here. Thank you, Bala. And uh, thank you all editors for this really nice opportunity. So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about what non-waves and T's are as we go along. Okay, so this talk is about the steady Stokes equation. Everything we're going to talk about is steady Stokes. So here is the Navier Stokes equation where I have uh, thrown away the entire left hand side. So we have viscous forces balancing pressure. So in such a Stokes flow, we all know from early college that if I put a little sphere in Stokes, steady Stokes flow, then its weight its reduced weight is balanced by the drag forces. And so it comes down at a particular velocity V, which, uh, sorry, U0. So uh, here A is the radius of the sphere. Rho P is the density of the uh, material of the sphere. Rho F is fluid density and G is gravity. And then um, on this side, we have the kinematic viscosity and the uh, velocity of the sphere. So the velocity of the sphere can be, uh, you know, written in simple terms like this. So we all know that if we put a little sphere in um, a fluid, which is still, it's going to reach steady state velocity at some pretty early time. And after that, it's going to keep going down at this velocity. So it's going to sem sediment in a straight vertical line. What happens when there are two spheres in Stokes flow who are talking to each other? So the, this sphere is disturbing the flow field for this one. And this one is disturbing the flow field for that one. And so both of them, in fact, if you place two spheres horizontally in fluid, they start going downwards at a constant velocity. They reach a terminal velocity as before. And uh, this velocity is a little bigger than the old U0. So U0 was the velocity for one particle. And these two are separated by a distance D where each of them has a radius A. So like they come down in a steady vertical fashion uh, with a slightly increased uh, velocity and you can see that as d goes to infinity each sphere like goes back to its u0 that velocity now the this formula is derived from pretending that the other part for each sphere pretending that the other one is a point force and that point force is basically pointing in the gravity direction it's reduced weight going down and this is the famous formula for stokes lets where you get the velocity r is now going to be d in this case and uh, i is the identity uh, matrix so this is how it works with mu being the viscosity and you can very quickly work out that this is indeed the case now if the two are vertically placed again there's a faster velocity than before and in fact it's even faster when it's vertical than when they place side by side so uh, the the extra velocity that you get is twice that of when they place side by side. Now, this is the interesting case for us, which we're going to, you know, keep referring back to. It's when we place two identical spheres, but, you know, with some separation in the vertical as well as some separation in the horizontal. Such a thing will keep, you know, following its line 
the line joining them it will keep going along that line it will preserve the distance between the spheres so it acts almost practically like it's a rigid body and it moves not just vertically but also sideways so there is a drift velocity in the horizontal direction now all of this gives you a picture of two spheres what they will do uh, when they're very small and uh, at very low reynolds number in a flow and they're sedimenting but what happens when there are three spheres already things start getting very interesting because i told you that each sphere makes the other one go faster now the middle guy has two of them making it go faster so it goes even faster than the other two and then the other two because there are these you know slant lines connecting them there is a drift in this manner so you immediately see that there is going to be some kind of clumping and here is an experiment done by rahul chajwa where he actually uh, put five spheres in the in a very viscous fluid silicone oil in this case and you can immediately see the clumping so this drift velocity thing is actually working in experiment and you see that it's already doing pretty complicated things with five spheres so all of this like you know i mean i went from two to three to five so don't worry i'm not going to do seven nine and so on i'm going to directly go to infinity so like uh, here is an infinite array of spheres and uh, they have been placed not just in an exact straight line but it's basically an array with equal spacing d but it's been perturbed slightly in the vertical direction their initial locations have been perturbed slightly in the vertical direction and this leads to the famous crowley instability which was actually uh, brought out more than 50 years ago and basically it tells you the exact same thing that spheres are spheres placed in an array are always always unstable to clumping so as time goes on this wave grows in amplitude and the clumping also grows a lot so then this q is the wave number which is 2 pi divided by the wave length and the wave length like this distance is uh, n times d so we've used wavelengths which are uh, integer multiples of the little distance d between the spheres and you can imagine that the shortest wavelength i can have is with three of these so i have a maximum wave number which is pi in non-dimensional so then i cannot produce wave numbers bigger than this so crowley showed very nicely by nearest neighbor theory that there is a growth rate beta and beta is on the y-axis here and qd the non-dimensional wave numbers on the x-axis and he showed that if you only consider nearest neighbor interactions then this is the growth rate but you could consider all infinite of them and you know because that because the effect falls off as one by r uh, it makes a small difference but it doesn't qualitatively change the answer so the summary so far is that anytime you have an array of spheres they are unstable there's always a growth rate at any wave number so that's the moral now what happens with an array of sedimenting stoxian spheroids so all we've done is we've taken crowley and we've you know instead of spheres put ellipsoids so that is going to be the whole of this talk what happens to an array of ellipsoids which are in stokes flow so this work was started by rahul chajwa who graduated a couple of years ago and he is now a postdocing in stanford and harshit joshi is a present student who has taken up this work and he's looking at many interesting nonlinear aspects and uh, Sriram Ramaswamy is the uh, theorist we've collaborated with and Narayanan Menon is the experimenter. So Narayanan uh, has, you know, guided Rahul through these very nice experiments that you will see. The experiments were done in ICTS. So what he's got is a box. So we just made a big glass box about this big and it's thin on this side. So then like uh, we have these, uh, we have, we have it full with silicone oil and we put these resin discs that we've 3D printed. So we uh, push them through a comb like structure here. We bring down this comb like structure and then these, uh, these uh, uh, 
uh, resin stuff, which is only slightly heavier than the silicone oil, denser than the silicone oil, starts sedimenting. And, uh, you know, for a box of about this size, like a foot, it takes about half an hour or one hour for these uh, particles to all reach the bottom. So this is basically the experimental setup. So like me being not an experimenter, the, you know, the heights of experimental expertise I can reach are taking fluid and dropping things through fluid. So this is one among a class of experiments that happens um, that, that I can be involved in. Okay, so what then happens? And these disks are proxy for very thin ellipsoids. So believe me, like it's not very different from a, I mean, very thin ellipsoid. So what happens in basic interactions between ellipsoids? We discussed a lot about spheres, now in ellipsoids you can actually write down how they drift this equation x x is in the horizontal direction and z is in the vertical direction so we show how the the equation for drift the equation for sedimenting and this is the extra velocity compared to what each ellipsoid will anyway have this is the extra velocity produced by one on the other and then theta is the angle that it makes with the that the normal makes with the horizontal so the ellipsoid makes with the vertical and this uh, change in this angle is given by this so this angle thing is going to make ellipsoids completely completely different from spheres so this is a very simple way that we can write you know what happens to to ellipsoids so notice that if I threw away this term, so that means that if I had one ellipsoid in the middle of nowhere with no other ellipsoid to change its path, it would still respond to its own orientation. So its own orientation is going to give it a drift. That's the important thing to remember. So an ellipsoid can actually be described as a, you know, line of continuous line of stokeslets or for thinking purposes, we can think of it as two spheres or two point forces which are just connected by a rigid rod that gives most of the answers to you know up to a constant so then like it's these two spheres which are connected by a rigid rod and uh, i mean in stokes flow even if they weren't connected by a rigid rod two spheres would maintain their distance and they would drift if they had an angle so that's exactly what's happening to an ellipsoid even when the other one is not there now the other one comes and then you get a already quite a complicated uh, thing happening and then uh, this angle keeps you know the angle can keep changing and when it changes interesting things can happen even in a pair of ellipsoids and i'd like to refer uh, the listeners to this paper because it is one of the early papers in the International Journal of Multiphase Flow uh, by S. Kim, and uh, it's a very famous paper. So in case you haven't read it, it's worth reading. Okay, so what happens? So let's do a thought experiment before we go to the real experiments. So Crowley instability, we already discussed. The minute you have a slight, you know, increase in the number density of spheres in any place, that sphere, the, the, the guy in the middle is going to fall faster. It's going to create these, uh, you know, sticks which are inclined. And so these, all of these will try to move in this direction. All of those will try to move in that direction. So uh, this drift creates the Crowley instability. Now, what we uh, have found, and we'd like to show it this way, is that ellipsoids are different, or they can be different. The point is that, you know, this initially this one falls faster than the others. That's true. So you start seeing something like a Crowley, but then the ellipsoid that's inclined like this, it gets it gets a drift in that direction. So like it's not just falling down, but it also gets a torque which makes it inclined like this. And we know that the minute anything is inclined like this, it's going to drift in that direction. When it's inclined like this, it's going to drift in that direction. So in other words, it's opposing the clumping. It's opposing the tendency to clump. So the minute it tries to clump, it reorients and the orientation resists the clumping. So this is basically the mechanism that we're going to talk about. So that's all there is. Like um, we'll see various 
um, you know, uh, aspects of this coming up. So uh, Bala, uh, somebody is raising their hand. Do I be, uh, take questions in the middle or do I wait till the end? It is up to you, uh, Rama. Uh, okay, so maybe I mean, I'll stop in a few minutes. I'll, I'll stop in a couple of places when people can ask questions. Okay. Uh, is, um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so here's how we set up Rama, the experiment. Yeah. May I suggest that you finish the talk? Right, okay. And then we will take questions. Okay, okay, great, great. Okay, so um, we uh, set up the experiment in this way. So what we're trying to do is, we're trying to put different wavelengths of perturbation and see what happens to these sedimenting ellipsoids. So here is the place where the, all the ellipsoids sit in the experiment. And here is the comb structure which pushes it down. And let me tell you, like there's a lot of thought and engineering which went into this to give really clean experiments. So I'm really, really proud of Rahul for doing this experiment. And so we're able to get, you know, all these particles stay vertical at the initial place uh, to, you know, like just plus minus seven or eight degrees. So all of them are practically vertical and they all come down at the same time by this very gentle, beautifully designed comb. And the comb is this long. So there's a lot of stuff which went into that now the point is like in the crowley instability i showed you that uh, you know there's a vertical perturbation given to these ellipsoids now in an experiment there's no way we can give a vertical perturbation so instead of that what we do is we give a perturbation in the x direction so like we don't place all of them in the same holes we uh, have a spacing here and this spacing is as near to a sinusoid in the x in the x itself a sinusoidal perturbation in the x itself that we can manage so like because it's integer number of gaps that we have to put it in you see the red dots which kind of are like a sine wave but they're not exactly a sine wave but they're not too bad and we do this and let the ellipsoids go so then let's before we look at the experiment let's look at the theory a little bit so so what happens here is that uh, we generalize those three equations i showed you for a couple of spheroids to an array of spheroids so we can now sum up over all the neighbors but uh, you know we've done numerics including all the neighbors but uh, we're going to do theory with just the nearest neighbor and this is pretty decent for the experiment because the experiment is in a box which is not too wide so actually the walls act as a screen for you know effects that are coming from very far away in this plane so that's actually a nice thing and we get pretty decent um, understanding of this from just doing theory so here are the equations which we are solving we linearize we do everything that you normally do for stability analysis you Fourier transform in X because remember we gave a wave like perturbation in X and we restricted ourselves to nearest neighbor interactions and the linear thing looks like this after some very special non dimensionalization which I'll come to very special normalization apart from non dimensionalization so we get this is X which is the perturbation uh, in uh, the Fourier transform perturbation in the horizontal direction, the same in the vertical direction and the angle. So these three are the variables. So we've actually like brought down this ellipsoid to just a point particle with an orientation. So it's basically a point force with an orientation and the orientation responds to other point forces. It's as simple as that. And so it's very easy to see that, and these are all constants which are given here. It's very easy to see that when I have an x dot equal to ax, I can just pull out the eigenvalues of this thing and I can get answers about stability. Incidentally, the a is not self-adjoint. So a a dagger is not equal to a dagger a and we're going to come back to this point. So but this uh, solution of this itself will give us an idea about the stability. And remember that the sphere was never, never stable it was always always unstable but already we see that there is 
a boundary like there are all these boundaries and this side is unstable and that side is neutrally stable so we never have a decaying perturbation but we have waves so we have wave like solutions in the neutrally stable uh, regime so the point is this so we uh, draw this for different different eccentricities so this line is for more a disk like a pretty you know flat oblate spheroid and this is more like a sphere like object and you can see that it's always unstable the more sphere like it becomes and for a perfect sphere this line is just vertical so it's always uh, unstable and you can see that this is a log scale so uh, the the mm, lattice spacing for getting it for stabilizing it becomes higher 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 and so like whereas we are in this disk like regime we are in the very uh, we are actually somewhere here we are in this regime with our experiment so for the rest of the talk we'll be talking about that regime okay so uh, we solve that set of equations x dot equal to ax and we get this blue region to be neutrally stable the pink region to be unstable and these dots are the experimental points and most rewardingly you see that there's a high correlation i mean basically the experiment agrees with this simple theory so we now have a bunch of wave numbers and some lattice spacing so the interesting thing is that when your lattice spacing is slightly high like which it is in any dilute suspension the minute you have a slightly high lattice spacing you go into a stable region and this itself is uh, very surprising because normally any bunch of sedimenting bodies is always unstable so here is an array a perfect array which we've perturbed in this manner which actually can be stable but when I said stable, I said that it's not self, it, it's a matrix which is not self adjoint. So that tells you that while it cannot have exponential growth of disturbances, it can have algebraic growth and we'll come to that in the next slide. But you see that these, uh, this is from the experiment. You can see that the way it goes down with time, it produces a wave like perturbation. You can actually see a wave there. And uh, it, this is in early times, I'm just showing the early time picture, whereas the unstable case already is doing clumping, which is fairly evident, like it very quickly goes into the clumping mode. Okay, so now this is about what happens when you have a non-normal stability matrix. This is now pretty well known in fluid mech, but just in case somebody is not familiar with it, what you can have is when you have a stability matrix, which is not self adjoint you you can have eigenvectors which are not orthogonal to each other and when eigenvectors are not ortho orthogonal to each other you could have all of them decaying so all eigenvalues are less than zero so every eigenvector every perturbation is actually decaying but you can have the resultant which at zero time was this black arrow at some intermediate time has become this red arrow which is a lot bigger than the black arrow so you can have transient algebraic growth that's the summary when you have uh, eigenvectors which are not orthogonal so and that's the situation with our a so like we have to see whether our you know so-called wave-like solutions uh, stay like waves or they go into some non-wave thing okay so the um, way to understand that uh, stability matrix and the way to understand how to normalize it comes from this kind of split and this is like a very nice way of looking at it because all i've done is i've taken the a matrix and i've written it as a sum of two things and the first thing is just x beating against z and that's just the crowley instability it's the orientation which comes and stabilizes things exactly as we discussed the orientation brings a lateral drift which stabilizes so like if I didn't have this row, if I just had X and Z, this is just an unstable matrix. It's as simple as that. Also, it's a normal matrix and it just leads to the Crowley instability exactly as in spheres. So if this thing didn't have a significant contribution from its orientation, you would just get the good old instability. Now we drop the Z 
and we uh, we write it like this so you see that this thing is x the horizontal perturbation beating against the orientation and now this is exactly the equation of a harmonic oscillator so you'll just see periodic behavior in the orientation and the x dependence so it's exactly just a horizontal uh, harmonic oscillator this too is a normal matrix nothing mysterious about it normal matrix normal matrix so normal plus normal you get a no non normal matrix and then like this can lead to funny kinds of uh, algebraic growth and because of the way we've normalized these things this thing gives a natural notion of energy so whenever i have a you know system which is non normal and i say things are algebraically growing i have to have a notion of an energy which is algebraically increasing in time for a short time of course at long time it will decay if there was no non linearity but in our system there is going to be non linearity so then like this system um will display wave like behavior at short time and you know something else at long time so let's just watch a movie of that so the wave like behavior will kind of become apparent if you stare and you know if you give it a kind interpretation so it's becoming a wave and that wave like that amplitude of that wave goes up and down it becomes now flat again but by this time you can see some non linearity picking up like these lines are not exactly vertical you can see some disturbances coming up already <clears throat> and now just to contrast it with the unstable one you will see that the there's a qualitative behavior difference in behavior at early time so this is the whole tank the picture of the whole tank and this is a portion of the tank where you see this very neat i mean this is a nice experiment if i say so myself or i should give narayanan the credit okay so now we have this as our stability diagram we had this stability diagram before it's the exact same diagram except that now we plotted in color what algebraic growth one can expect and you see that if you're in this end of the whole uh, uh, distance uh, lattice spacing to wave number space you don't get much algebraic growth so these are basically near neutral and they're just going to show wave like behavior all the time whereas when you you know somewhere in this regime in other words you're in smaller wave numbers or larger wave lengths you start seeing pretty big algebraic growth this is 6 on a log scale so like you start seeing pretty big algebraic growth and if there was no non linearity taking over this is how the algebraic growth would do so the energy would go up and down in this periodic fashion so you'd just get waves repeated and the perturbation would go up and down in this periodic and algebraic fashion now what happens though is that at later time there is non linearity taking over and this is the experiment and this is the theory and in the theory we have a handle on things like we can change the initial perturbation we have a better handle on the initial perturbation than in the experiment but you can see that uh, i mean qualitatively the two are doing the same thing so there are some of these runaway things which are going very fast and to give you a sneak preview these are the t's we are going to talk about already you'll agree that these things are non waves and then we are going to see t's so let me play this again and you'll see the t so if you follow some of them you'll see a t formation like yeah this one for example it's trying to make a t yeah that one made a t but you'll see that the t is very quickly went away into v type things we'll talk about that and then i'm contrasting this to the non linear behavior in the unstable case the point i'm trying to make is that even visually you'll see that clumping is different the clumping behavior of this ellipsoids is different so if i want to understand how marine snow sinks in the ocean which is not quite circular or things like that i'd have to know whether it's in the stable or unstable regime and you can see that visually that the clumping is kind of bigger in this case okay so this uh, whole uh, slide is just to show that experiment and theory are not just matching qualitatively or visually they are also matching in the frequency of these waves that we calculate 
at different wave numbers. So the uh, dots are the experiment and the uh, solid lines are what we want to look at. So then um, it's not too bad. And then here is, a, you know, one of the very, very few experimental verifications of transient growth that I know of. So then like uh, this is the theory and this is the simulation which includes all the n particles and this shaded thing is the experiment. So you see that broadly the experiment and theory are looking like each other in both the x perturbation, the z perturbation and the theta. So we believe that we've actually demonstrated transient growth in the lab. Okay, so now that was about what we saw in the experiment and how it looked in the numerics. Now, like, let's try to understand the nonlinear portion a little better. So this is this beautiful uh, picture given in Koch and Shakfi, and there's another paper in IJMF which talks about similar things. So like here is a point force and they placed these ellipsoids all around in a circle uh, about the point with the point force as the center. And what you see here is something very interesting. So I told you that, you know, you can think of an ellipsoid as two spheres stuck to each other by a rigid rod. So here you have a vertical sphere and here you have a horizontal sphere. If you put it in this direction, what's what really happens is that this one is going to fall a lot faster than this one. That's what I told you earlier. So if I sit in the frame of reference of the centroid, then this one is coming in downwards. This one is going up actually. So now you can see that a vertical one and a horizontal one are going to form a T. So they're going to form something like this. So basically like here's one. So if I place them one above the other with arbitrary orientations, this one, uh, the, the resultant orientation change on that one will be clockwise and this one will be anticlockwise until it forms a T and the T starts falling faster. And this T thing is an exact solution of the far field equations. So like if I pretend that it's still far field and they're still far away from each other, which I should not pretend, you will see that that's always going to be a solution. Once it forms a T, it's always going to stay as a T. But that's not real life. We have to remember that these are, you know, equations which are correct at various orders in one over the separation distance. And when the separation distance is small, I'll have to go to many, many orders in order to get that, get the answer properly. And when you take into consideration reflections and the lubrication uh, approximation between these ellipsoids, you'll see that the T, it initially likes to form a T when it's far away, it forms a T. Once it forms a T, the T goes unstable and it forms something like a V. And then the V shoots off. So like in this whole clumping array, whenever you get a V, there's just two of them shooting off. So um, Rahul did an analysis of this Kokshak thing and he showed that only the orientations there and there are going to be stable. So the T is basically the most stable thing that you can form in this system. So that's where the T comes in. And here's just a simulation to show you like examples of T formation in very clear. Uh, yeah, like look at that one. That is a T. Look at that one. That is a T. This one used to be a T and became a V. So you see a lot of this in the flow. So things which were, you know, um, both kind of vertical initially start, you know, the lower one starts becoming horizontal. So you see T, 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 T. So you see T's all over the place. Okay, so now I told you that when your two particles are very close to each other are you know, approximation of them as point forces is not very brilliant. And uh, this was known a long time ago to anybody working in uh, Stokes, Stokesian hydrodynamics. And what they did was they produced like better and better approximations. So if this is the surface of sphere one, this is the surface of sphere two or body one, body two, you know that uh, this, the first correction is designed to satisfy the boundary conditions here, but not there. And the other one satisfies here, but not there. So when I sum them up, I get an error in the boundary condition. So I could write further 
terms in that expansion to satisfy the boundary condition and that's called the first reflection the second reflection and so on so i'm doing better and better approximations the first reflection is correct up to order a square a4 by d uh, order 1 over d to the power 4 the separation to the power 4 and this is correct to 1 over d to the power 7 so we're actually getting rather good as we increase the level of reflection so just to compare you know in the t formation we have in the neutrally stable case this is a stokes let simulation and second reflection i didn't show the first reflection so you see that both of them are qualitatively the same although you know in detail they're very different so like uh, this system is quite chaotic so we do not expect the same answer but you see that there's a slightly decreased tendency to form t's when in real life so there's more a tendency for the t to go away so this is the basic model in the second one and now this is the unstable case so the second reflection again makes some difference but the qualitative picture is captured by the uh, stokeslet approximation except at very late times where the stokeslet is giving this additional clumping and one thing i should say is that we use a kind of you know um, repulsion when they are trying to touch each other or go into each other and that is having some effect so we're right now working on that to clean it up before we uh, you know uh, stake a claim but on the whole you're, you're seeing what how different the unstable case is from the neutrally stable case even when everything became non-linear so this kind of summarizes the difference in the non-linear regime between the um, uh, uh, the uh, stable, the neutrally stable case and the unstable case. So here what we did is we took this as our initial configuration and we took the exact same wave number, the exact same conditions for stable and unstable, except we have to change D by A to make one of them neutrally stable and one of them unstable. But everything else was just matched identically so if you can see this little thing we start out with this initial thing and we take every particle and we look at how many particles live inside that little red ring and the way we've drawn the red ring it's actually three particles inside so in the initial configuration we always have three particles inside uh, inside every what we call clump so every clump is a clump of size three. So I go next to next to it and I check it has two neighbors. So everybody has two neighbors within the domain. And so everybody is in a clump of size three. Although like, you know, this thing is a continuous array, but still we call it a clump of size three when I've centered it at different, different points. So now in the neutrally stable case, you will see that, you know, some clumps of size two are coming up some clumps of size one are coming up but on the whole it remains size three so like you know you're getting these t's and you're getting these v's like a small number of them are becoming the t's and v's so that's what you're seeing here but nothing else is happening and uh, also like the number of nearest neighbors on an average goes down because it's spreading out vertically so the volume it occupies is getting bigger and bigger and uh, you see the you know, pretty big contrast in clumping when you have uh, the unstable case. So I told you that, and TI is intermediate time, TF is final time of our simulation. So you see that at intermediate times, and this is with the first reflection and the Stokeslet, it makes some difference how it clumps. I told you that when uh, things come very close, then the reflections start becoming important. So you see that there are clumps of size five. So like you see, I mean, even visually, you can see that there are bigger clumps. So the distribution of clumping is very different in the unstable case as in the neutrally stable case. And uh, there is some difference between the first reflection and this one, uh, the, the Stokeslet point force approximation. At, interestingly, Although you get these big clay, big uh, clumps of size five and so on at intermediate time, at long time, those clumps again go away. And you're very likely to get, you know, particles who are all by themselves, who are in a clump of size one. So there's particles who become loners. And then there's this famous 
you know, clumps of size two, which are either T's or V's, most usually either T's or V's who go off into nowhere. So there is this phenomenon in the nonlinear regime of temporary clumping and then later again unclumping. And you see that in simulations as well. So here is, you know, three points, the unstable, stable and the stable thing which doesn't have transient growth. So like now, I'm sorry, these are all, you know, actually this is now horizontal and this is how they're falling vertically in time. You see that when in the regime of very little transient growth, nothing much is happening. It's basically waves all the way. And whereas in the unstable one, you see that the clumping is quite different and then it starts kind of unclumping towards the end. And the um, transiently growing case shows weaker clumping, but it does show some level of clumping. So this is basically what happens to trajectories. And uh, I'd like to end here by saying that the one main thing we learn from this is that the problem of sedimentation is not completely solved or something, even in a very straight array of very simple ellipsoids. Uh, there's all these very interesting things that happen, things like where you can look for uh, Hamiltonian behavior in one portion of it, like we saw the spring mass kind of horizon, um, harmonic oscillator, and you can get unstable things. These things can couple in interesting ways. They can be periodic and aperiodic solutions. And in the nonlinear thing, we saw pretty interesting structure formation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rama, um, for a very interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, we enjoyed that. Uh, the floor is open for uh, questions. Please unmute yourself uh, and uh, ask questions. Uh, Charles, well, you have a question? Please go ahead. Charles, you're muted. Oh, it's very nice. Thank you. And Stokes uh, Law uh, was there and gravity was there. But can I ask you a question that what should be there is not there? And that okay. is the Coriolis term. Yeah. The, the so, Coriolis term, that's not on the table. And would you so get, you, do you think, do you think that what you're seeing uh, is going, is, is when you do the experiment, you, you can't take the Coriolis term off. But it might be uh, something differently. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if you, when you go to sleep at night, what do you, do you think about the Coriolis term? <laughs> so, by Coriolis term, do you mean just what comes out of this thing rotating? Well, what well, the Coriolis term is the um, uh, is a non is a so you have an inertial frame or a non-inertial frame, and the Coriolis term is the the one okay, that gives okay, you something. Okay. No, so uh, oh, another, uh, uh, just one, just one more point. If you need to get out of the Earth, go to the spaceship. And what does the spaceship have? No gravity, but they do have Corey, a twenty, uh, uh, you know, uh, an order of magnitude uh, Coriolis effect. Okay. And I was wondering how that turns out for you guys. And that, okay, that, that's, so, that's my question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me tell you that. In all these equations, we've solved it in the lab frame. So we do not have a net Coriolis term. We do not, we're not living in any particle frame. So we do not have a Coriolis term coming out of any non-inertial frame of reference because we are in the lab frame of reference. Secondly, there is rotational effects. If I sit on a particle and it's rotating, that is going the um, the, the effective rotation is going to affect the other particles, but fortunately for us, it doesn't appear at the lowest order. It comes at higher orders in the expansion. So we are treating these particles as being far away. And so like the rotation of this one is not going to affect this. And so uh, it's basically the facts and corrections, which we are ignoring. Does okay. that answer okay. your question? Thank, thank you. Yeah, Rama. Uh, uh, can you I? Your hands up? 
I'm just placing my physical hand and uh, yeah, <laughs> just um, you mentioned that you want to apply this uh, this type of theory to marine sedimentation, but I want in that case you have uh, some turbulence gates. So I wonder uh, uh, what is a corresponding turbulence scale that can uh, somehow influence uh, this behavior and disrupt this behavior? Because if you have a fast turbulence scales, of course. Uh, they will probably dominate with their advection. Right, right. So like, yeah, when you have turbulence, basically, if you, I, I think that the turbulence scales that are going to affect marine snow the most are going to be sub Kolmogorov scales because the Kolmogorov scales are too slow and you know, like this thing, gravity is going to win in those cases, uh, the things, the, the, uh, you know, scales which are much, much bigger than Kolmogoro. So they may get dragged along for a while, but ultimately gravity is going to win and you won't see too much interesting there. But in the scales which are, you know, the very intermittent and very fast rotating vortices, those are going to make a big difference. They can effectively compete against gravity. So they can actually centrifuge it out and the Coriolis effect, you know, the centrifugal effect, not Coriolis, is going to become big uh, compared to gravity in those cases. So um, in the ocean, like it depends on the Reynolds number. Some parts of the ocean are so quiet that you may not get these intermittent vortices. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rama, I have a question. I mean, you started by saying stroke flow. Could you expand on where the nonlinear interactions come, nonlinear effects come about? It's basically uh, boundary conditions. There's large numbers of boundary conditions you're satisfying, and that system can therefore go chaotic. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, in the context of not just a line of uh, particles the way you've done, but in a random, uh, not, not necessarily random, in structured random moving or random flows and particles, they all behave quite differently. Um, in the case of structured array, the increase in drag goes as um, one third power of volume fraction, whereas uh, it goes as square root of volume fraction if you have random flows in array. But when you let them randomly move, it you get the uh, uh, yet another different behavior as shown by Bachelor. So instead of a line, if you have a spatially distributed distribution of particles, um, would the behavior be similar or uh, are they going to be expect vastly different behavior? Because marine snow, they don't get started like a horse race. They, they are randomly distributed uh, uh, yeah. in some way. So how, what can we learn from what you have done and take it to a much uh, uh, sort of a randomly distributed case? Yeah, I will stop there. I uh, don't think you can learn too much, to be very frank, because this, this thing is beautiful because it's an array, because we can write down things as, you know, sums of things which then look like diffusion terms, look like curl terms. You can write down, I mean, every, every beauty of this thing comes because it's an array. So like, uh, it may or may not have anything to do with the random distribution. But there's one take home message you can see here, which is that there is this clumping and declumping. So and when things are, you know, maybe we should look for signatures of declumping. For example, like any time ellipsoidal objects come together, they seem to go off in pairs. So things like that, like the Declumping is one thing that comes out of this. And another general message is that when the lattice spacing is grows bigger compared to the radius, you can have a lot more stabilization that's happening. It may or may not actually suppress all the exponential growth in, in a 
random array. But uh, you can see that the tendency to clump will come down. I see. Thank you. And well, it's I not think that because of the distance, like even if I scale it in time, I scale everything. Even then, like just the fact that the uh, spacing is much bigger than the radius is going to have an effect. So we're going to take home qualitative things, Bala, not quantitative. No, no, I didn't expect to be quantitative, but but there is quant qualitatively a lot to be learned from this. Nice, very beautiful set of experiments. So I just wanted to uh, listen to your take on that. Uh, now, uh, Kunal uh, has a question. Kunal, please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ma'am, uh, thank you for talk. It was a nice talk. Uh, so maybe due to some internet issues, I'm having. Your voice is not clear. Uh, Okay, uh, so ma'am, can you uh, type it in uh, type it in the chat chat box? I will type. I can hear you now. I will type in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, ma'am, thank you. Uh, so, I just wanted to understand these about number of fees. So, are the number of fees bigger or bigger? I think you'll have to type this in, Kunal. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay, uh, while Kunal is typing that stuff, uh, any other questions by others? Yes, I just have one, one other curiosity. Now we are focusing on some experiments uh, with fibers that are small ellipsoid, can be simulated like small ellipsoid, but curved, so with a little anisotropy. And okay. uh, I was wondering uh, if, uh, I mean, I mean, your theory, I mean, this type of patterns that partic that sedimenting particles uh, uh, of, a, of a ellipsoidal shape can be influenced by curvature, which of course I suppose so, but uh, uh, maybe any tiny disturbance in the shape uh, can actually give rise to some strange behavior. Yeah, so, uh, so in other words, you're asking like, can I take a fiber which is slightly more complicated in shape with the curvature? Can I have a simple equation which describes it? Like, you know, in an LCD Well, there is the model by Hinch and Leal, uh, which uh, we are using. It's a, it's a Stokesian model uh, of some okay. years ago. And okay. so I was thinking maybe you can use that. Yeah, that's a good point. So you're saying since we know these other things we can look for patterns in them and we may get a richer variety of patterns yeah sounds nice if you could share the paper with me that would be nice with, sure yeah and i can see kunal's question now he says is the number of t's or v's okay let me read uh, kunal's question yeah uh, uh rama can you hear me yeah i can hear you uh, uh, I'm going to read Kunal's question. Uh, um, he's asking, is the number of T's or V's higher? Okay. And then so, he, mm. uh, go ahead and answer that. And I, he has another question. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, like, basically, I don't know whether the number of T's or V's is higher because, like, when I do uh, the whole uh, calculation by Stokes Let's, I see T's all the time. And when I repeat the same calculation with the first or second reflection, the corrections, I see that some of the T's are unstable and go into V's. So like since all these approximations are only approximate when the particles come very close to each other, only like a complete Stokes solution, a numerical solution can give us the answer. And in that case, what we normally see is something forms a T, but it doesn't remain a T. Everything starts by forming a T, but then it slowly slides off and becomes a V. So this is what we are seeing. And okay. the second question is, will the shape change make a different flow pattern depending on the application? Yes, indeed it will. And that's what Alfredo was saying just now. Like if you have a fiber which is slightly curved, everything is going to change. And definitely these particles are going to drive some interesting flow. And the last question is, please share or repeat about association or disassociation of particles. So these are not association or disassociation. 
they just particles coming very nearby and then like they cannot walk into each other we've made sure of that by putting a repulsion when they're actually about to touch each other and then like the dynamics uh, you know makes them do something so when we do the exact solution we're actually like uh, satisfying lubrication theory when they're coming very close to each other we're actually getting uh, behavior which is reasonably described by lubrication theory though not quite so that's basically what's happening uh, rama um i have a question in the sense uh, do you see in the experiments or in your computations clustering of more than two uh, why should it be limited to two do you have patterns where three or four of them come together so what's so special about uh, just a clumping of only two forming a TRV. So like in this case, like we did have clumps of five and so on, as you can see here, right? Okay. So yeah. you do have like clumps of much more than two. Okay. But at long times, these clumps tend to declump or go away into, you know, just twos. And another point I should make is that in our experiment, you know, we had wavelength, the entire wavelength consisted of 12 particles. So suppose I could make one very long wave, which consists of 100 particles. I'm very sure that I'll get clumps of 20 and so on. But because this experiment is limited in its extent, and we did the theory to suit the experiment, we got these small clumps. So it remains to be seen if we have a very, very large number of particles per wave. And my immediate guess is you're going to get much, much bigger clumps. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Okay, if not, Rama, I want to thank you again uh, for uh, a very interesting physics-oriented uh, talk on the dynamics of particles. Uh, and uh, uh, just because it's in the Stokes regime, it's not like simple and predictable, it's pretty complicated. Uh, so a very illuminating uh, flow. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, for everyone, uh, we will see in two more weeks, uh, uh, we will have another